Hello, I'm Joe Chamberlain, Executive Director of the Coastside Land Trust. And today we are fortunate to have distinguished Professor Dan Costa presenting our second of two marine mammal webinars. Today's uh, webinar is entitled The Secret Life of Marine Mammals, How We've Pulled Back This Curtain. And I know there's extensive research done by you and your lab, Dan, and I understand you're one of the leading researchers, researchers in marine mammals on the planet. And we were so thrilled with last week's and uh, no pressure, but we're all really looking forward to hearing your presentation today. Go ahead, Dan. Thank you very much. It's always a pleasure to be able to talk to folks even, even so remotely. Uh, the talk I'm going to give today is uh, sort of a review, and I, I thought sort of over my career, I have been fortunate enough to get in in the beginning of when we started to figure out how to study these animals for real. And I was a, a postdoc with a guy named Jerry Coyman, who I'll talk about in a minute, when the first time depth recorder was being developed. And this was the infancy of uh, biotelemetry, biologging with marine mammals. So over the course of my career, I've seen tremendous changes in our ability to study these animals. And we all hear about biotechnology, and most people think of recombinant DNA and DNA sequencing. I like to think of biotechnology as the advances in using digital electronics to study animals in the wild. So <clears throat> to get us started, here's a picture of a minke whale in the Antarctic that I took some years ago. And one of the reasons I work on seals is because you can actually work with them on that they come onto the beach. But to me, this is the epitome of the problem we have faced. This is the part of the uh, life of a cetacean that you see. And even for seals, once they go underwater, we don't know what they're doing. And this represents maybe 10 or 20% of the life of the animal when it's at the surface breathing. So the question is, how do we go about studying the animal in the environment that it it exists in. I, I learned to scuba dive in high school, <clears throat> and that's what got me interested in marine biology. But ironically, scuba diving is really not going to help you. These animals are so fast and so they dive so deep that the, the things that we can do that would be traditional for observational biology in the terrestrial world, we really can't do in the marine environment, except for subtitle ecology or study fish and, and near shore animals. So <clears throat> what I want to do is give you an, an idea of how things have changed. And this is going to be a, a review of a lot of people's work. I'm the one, I was directly involved in almost all the SEAL related work, but I want to say from the outside, this is a review of our field, of my colleagues uh, in the marine mammal world, and to just gives you some insight into how things have changed in our understanding of what these animals do. Now I use this slide because in 1967, I was in high school, and this is what we knew. If you looked at a book or a paper or a review of what we knew about marine mammals and what they were capable of, capable of doing, this was the extent of our knowledge. Uh, a handful of seals and sea lions, uh, a uh, sperm whale that was caught in a transatlantic cable that lit up 100 meters that had died when they, they found it there on the cable. And so this is, this is what we knew, not a lot. So, I mentioned a guy named Jerry Coyman. Uh, he was really a pioneer that got this whole field started. This is Jerry as a graduate student working in the Antarctic in the early 60s. And what he did is, is Weddell seals have this, they're with the southernmost seal. And they live uh, during the winter through these ice holes that they maintain. So they're used to coming up to the same place to get a breath. And so it, Jerry realized this was a great experimental system. You have a place where an animal is going to freely do what it does, but it's going to come back to the same place. And so he said, gee, you know, I could put depth recorders on it, but no, but he couldn't go out and buy a depth recorder like we do today. And so he built one. And what this is, is a pressure housing. And within it is a, a little clock timer. You know, those little 60 minute clock timers and the, the, the face turns around and you, you do it for 60 minutes. Well, he put that inside here, and then he took a piece of glass that was circular glass and smoked it with, with a candle, so it had black soot on it. And then there was a little Gurdon tube, and the end of that was a, was a needle that would scribe a line in that smoked 
uh, the smoke on that piece of glass. And so the glass would turn for 60 minutes. And then as the animal went deeper, that little scribe would then trace, cut a trace in that smoke glass. And he was able to put these on these animals. Here he is attaching it to a seal that's in the hole. And it was able for the first time to get a, a diving pattern of a freely living animal. But that gave him a 60 minute dive and you know, it was a bit cumbersome, but you know, it was pretty revolutionary at the time. He wasn't satisfied with a kitchen timer and a underwater housing. And when I joined his lab in the, in the late 70s, he had a superb engineer who took his ideas and built this time depth recorder. This device is uh, all, uh, Jim Billups took a chunk of aluminum and built this thing from scratch. So this is all done on a, on, on a, in a mach by a machinist. This thing would have little spools. I used to talk about a strip chart recorder, but nobody knows what that is anymore because everything's done digitally. The film would, there'd be a spool of film here. The film would run across this surface and then spool up here. And there's a little battery, battery here, batteries, motor. It would turn this little spool and this film would run for 14 days. And there's a light emitting diode here. There's a pressure gauge running down through here. And this little arm would swing across the surface of this film. At the time, we would buy the film from Eastman Kodak. And they would say, well, you know, there's one, only one other organization that buys this film. And we can't tell you who that is. Years later, I, and the reason why is it's a super, super, super thin film. And, the, and we wanted it because we could put 14 days worth of film on the spool. Turns out it was part of the Keyhole satellite program, the Corona satellite program for uh, satellite surveillance. Before they had digital electronics, they would take images and jettison the cassette of film and then they would uh, catch it uh, from, by a parachute, by a plane. Anyway, funny little aside that we're using the same film that the CIA was using. So this is a picture of this device on an Antarctic fur seal, some work I uh, was involved in many years ago. And you can see it's kind of big. Uh, we found out later that the way we attached it with the harness actually created more problems than the, the depth recorder itself. But we would cover these, these records. We developed the film in a dark room. And of course we had to put all that together in a dark room. So you can imagine making sure you didn't screw something up. When it was done, we get this 14 day record and we would copy it in this long chart. And so you can see the light emitting diode uh, exposing that film. And so here's the surface, here's a dive, here's the surface, here's a dive. And we would hand digitize this record, which would take about 24 hours of nonstop just in craziness. And then we would analyze our records. So that really opened up a world. But the thing is, is we had to get the tag back. And if you didn't get it back, you wouldn't get any data. The other thing is you had to hope and pray that everything worked because it was uh, an air-filled cavity. It could leak. You could have missed a connection or screwed something up in the darkroom when you loaded the, loaded the film. So here's that device in 1983 on an Antarctic fur seal. And here's uh, the newer technology 20 years ago on the same species. And now we've added a satellite tracking device here, which would tell us anywhere on the planet that the animal is. Here is a VHF tag that tells us the animal's on the beach. Here's the VHF tag on, on this animal. And right here is a little electronic data logger that takes the place of this instrument here. And so this little data logger digitally collects the data, takes a time, a pressure point every minute. And we could get uh, several weeks to months and, and now we can get up to years of data from these little tags, these electronic tags. This was one of the first ones, this was called uh, Wildlife Computers, was a company up in Seattle. Uh, this is the MK3 shows you the digital electronics battery pack. Here's the pressure transducer. And this was all in a uh, air, you know, an air, air in a cylinder of titanium because this was one we used on elephant seals and elephant seals uh, we knew dove very deep. So we needed a, a system that uh, could withstand the pressure. This is that same device now. Uh, now it's called the MK9. This has been around for a while, but it's still one of the mainstays of of the biologging industry. You can see the battery. You have to recover the tag to get the, the data off of it. The depth sensor is right here. This has some light sensors. And we can also get temperature readings of the ocean. So now we're starting to get data on not only what the animal did, but the environment that the animal's in. And I'll talk more about that later.
So what did we find out? Well, here is uh, a, a representative uh, image of a track, of, sorry, of a record, diving record of an elephant seal. Uh, next time I'll talk exclusively about elephant seals and what we've learned over the almost 40 plus years of research on these animals. But the mat, we found that the maximum depth is 1,735 meters. That's well over a mile in, in depth. Uh, on average, they dive to about 516 meters, which is uh, times three, it's about 1,800 feet. And here, these, this is nighttime and this is daytime. So you can see in the daytime, they're diving deeper, nighttime shallower. And this kind of pattern where there's a day-night difference means they're feeding on vertically migrating prey that's in the, in the mesopelagic zone. So this is, uh, was one of those, again, what's also fun is being in this field is every now and then you're, you're, you find out about really new and exciting things. And this is uh, some work that Sasha Hooker did with Robin Baird up in uh, Canada at Halifax, University of Dalhousie. And she took these same little time depth accords that I just showed you and, and stuck them on the back of a beaked whale using suction cups. So beaked whales are an animal that we almost never see. And fortunately, there's a place called the Gully off of Sable Island where they're, they're quite common. She put a series of these, I think she got two, two records out. But all of a sudden, you know, we think, we, we were surprised when we found, found elephant seals routinely diving between four and five, 600 meters. We were pretty impressed with that with an occasional dive at 1700 meters, very rare. But here's an animal that is working 1200 meters. And not only that, but the, the, the duration of the dives was on the order of an hour. So these animals were making incredibly deep dives to routinely beyond 1000 meters and diving for up to an hour. Come back and talk more about this. But again, one of these sort of amazing discoveries that it was a combination of having the instrumentation, but with all of these studies, the ingenuity of field biologists to figure out how to get these instruments on an animal and how to get them back. And that's the other part of the story is the creativity of people figuring out how to work with animals in the wild. And I will say that key to all of this is understanding the natural history of your animal. If you don't have an idea of what the animal is going to do it doesn't allow you to begin to figure out ways that you can take advantage of its normal life behavior to figure out what it does when you can't see it. So as I go through this development, uh, a lot of these things people wouldn't even recognize anymore. This was the first acoustic data logger that we built for an elephant seal. Here's an underwater housing. This is a Sony digital audio tape recorder. It would record on tape. And so this is just a massive housing that we could put a digital audio tape recorder and here's the hydrophone in a potted in resonance. We put this all together, put it on the back of an elephant seal and graduate student uh, Stacy Fletcher was able to record uh, the underwater environment from an elephant seal for the first time. And this just gives you an idea of what she was able to see. Part of it is we wanted to know if elephant seals made sounds when they're at sea. And we found out that when they're at sea feeding, they're pretty quiet. And what we did see is all kinds of vocalization from, beak, from uh, tooth whales, adonisids. These are probably rhizos, dolphins, uh, who knows, all kinds of different vocalizations. And some sort of explosion. We don't know what it was, but some sort of a broadband. So this was the first acoustic data logger ever deployed on a free-ranging animal. We then worked with <clears throat> a, a, Bill Burgess, who was a postdoc then in Mbari, Monterey Bay Aquarium Research Institute, and he built this compact acoustic probe. This is a male elephant seal, and that's not all that compact, but this was an advanced where it used did fully digital electronics, uh, and we were able to, to attach these things, and elephant seals, we measured their, for, their the acoustic environment over their entire trip to sea. And again, we found out that these animals are very quiet. They don't make sounds when they're foraging at sea but we could pick up things like sperm whales and we actually got humpback whales singing sperm whales and also some uh, human anthropogenic sounds. Here with this thing had a whopping 340 megabytes of, of data capability. So again, that shows you how things have changed. We use these tags to understand how elephant seals might respond to uh, the acoustic thermography ocean climate, a study where they put a 
a source 50 miles off Half Moon Bay and 900 meters of water uh, to see how animals would respond to that source. And we dropped elephant seals offshore, and here's the normal diving behavior. We could see the sound being played for 20 minutes. And in this case, there was very little uh, response of that animal to that sound source. So this was the first time anybody had ever been able to look at the behavioral response of an animal to an active sound source in the environment. And people have since gone and done this with all kinds of other animals. That brings us to the DTAG. And uh, 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 Scott Johnson, who is a superb engineer, uh, working with Peter Tyak at the Woods Hole Oceanographic Institute, said, I can take that a step further. And so he created a tag that all of the things that I'm talking about here, we have a satellite tag here, acoustic recorder, depth recorder. He put all that together in a, in a little tiny tag. And here <clears throat> they're uh, putting that tag off the, the uh, coast of New England on a beaked whale. And this had a much higher quality uh, acoustic capability. And we, we've, this was uh, in the early 90s now, and <clears throat> actually in the late 90s, they were able to find things out about, here, here's the beaked whale. We're still finding new species of beaked whales. I think within the last decade, we found at least one beaked whale. These animals are 30 feet long. They're one of the most speciose cetaceans. There's probably 20 or so species of them, but we never see them. They're not only off, they're offshore in deep water, and that's an area that's very difficult to work in. Over the last decade, we have learned so, we probably know more about beaked whales than any other cetacean. And that's be all because of this uh, digital electronics. So <clears throat> they put the tags on these animals with suction cups. You can see the, the acoustic data logger here, the D tag is what they're called. And in this case, the animal, they're recording the digital sounds, digitally recording the echo or the sonar pulse of this animal. And then when that sonar pulse bounces off of prey, they get a reflection. So they hear the animal's vocalization and then they hear the echo coming back. And so here, <clears throat> here is the clicks, the echolocation clicks emanating from this beaked whale. And <clears throat> here is, uh, they're looking at distance because basically distance and time are equivalent. The, the, the faster, the shorter the time it takes for that click to that echo to come back to the recorder, the closer the animal is to that, to that uh, prey item. And so you can see here that these are the clicks of that beaked whale. And you can see the animal's getting closer and closer and closer. These are return echoes of that click. And then as the animal approaches the prey, it goes to a buzz, and then you then basically the animal closes on the prey. This is acceleration, it accelerates, and it captures the prey. So for the first time, we not only could hear the underwater acoustic environment, we could actually track when the animal was feeding and whether it was successful or not, and how it used echolocation. My graduate advisor, Ken Norris, always wanted to study how animals use echolocation in the real environment. He's unfortunately deceased, and I just think about how much he would have enjoyed to see this work today. So going back to the system that I'm working with, we didn't have anything as clever. Elephant seals don't make noise when they forage, and so we had to think of other ways of figuring out how to measure their feeding rates. And so one of the things we did, as a graduate student, Kerry Kuhn did this work, is we gave them a, a little temperature pill that they would swallow. And this temperature pill would transmit the temperature data to a pill, to a recorder on the outside of the animal. And we could monitor the stomach temperature. And so this is, these are data from a captive trial where we would feed the animal fish. Remember fish is at ambient temperature and the seal is at 37 degrees. And so when it would swallow that fish, its stomach temperature would decline. So this, is, uh, this was in the laboratory in captive tanks here at Long Marine Lab. And here we are out in the wild, and these are individual dives, and this is the stomach temperature of that seal as it was feeding. And so we were able for the first time to correlate diving behavior with when the animal actually fed. Now, <clears throat> one of the things, if again, fast forward, uh, Bernie LaBeouf, who started the elephant seal program many years ago, 
uh, early on co met a guy named Yasu Naito, who is a Japanese investigator, who's just one of my uh, just superb colleague. And of course, we all know that Japan is great with microelectronics. And so Naito would started with us early on and came up with something better than we had had. So he came up with a better time depth recorder. Uh, 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 he came up with all kinds of things. And one of the things more recently is he came up with a little accelerometer that in this case, you can see it glued to the underneath the jaw of an elephant seal. And this would monitor when the animal's jaw opened and closed. And so that accelerometer would tell us when the animal was feeding. And you can see here's our diving pattern. And whenever there's a red dot, that's a feeding event. And here's a period, I'll talk about this next time, where the animal wasn't feeding. But you can see all of these little red dots are when the animal opened and closed its jaw. And you can see this entire track of an animal uh, swimming out to sea. You can see all of the feeding events. You can see these periods where it's not feeding. And you can see the feeding events. And this allowed us a lot of things. One, it verified where the animals are actually feeding. It allowed us to determine that they are feeding at the bottom of the dives, which is what we always thought. But thinking it and actually verifying it are two different things. So this, uh, this sort of gave, gives you a lot of idea of, of what we learned about what they're doing, but we didn't really know where they're doing it. And so that takes us to an understanding of putting satellite tracking or GPS devices on animals so we can follow where, they're, where they are as, along with what they're doing. And this is a, a figure out of a book that was published in 1991 by Marianne Reedman. And this is where we thought elephant seals were foraging. This is where we thought they went. And that's because that's where we could fly planes and drive boats and we would look, to, look for elephant seals in that area. When we put the first time depth uh, tracking devices on elephant seals, we found out that they covered most of the Northeastern Pacific Ocean. And I'll talk more about this next time. But uh, again, here's a track of an elephant seal. And you can see that she was working, heavily working these seamounts uh, as part of her area that she was feeding in. We also were able to do some work where we had put our first satellite trackers out in 1995. And we we're able to tag the same female 11 years later. So this is a track. Uh, the red is as a six-year-old, and this is the female as a 17-year-old. And uh, again, I'll talk more about this uh, at, at another time. But we could show that this animal was doing the same thing uh, 11 years later. And we suspect he was, she was doing the same thing year after year. So <clears throat> that was what we were doing in terms of uh, Argo satellite telemetry. And we had funding as a part of a program called the Tagging Pacific Predators. And we had, were able to put money into developing new tag technology. And so one of the things we did is helped, was we paid an engineer to develop a GPS tracking. The problem with GPS, if you've ever turned on your system for the first time, it takes a while to get the satellite locations. And so we don't have that much time at the surface. And so we had to come up with some clever ways of getting the GPS locations of satellites and storing that and then recovering those data or transmitting those data so we're to figure out where the animals were going. And so these were uh, University of St. Andrews uh, GPS tag and, and uh, as well as a uh, wildlife computers. The other thing that this that the group at St. Andrews did is this GSM option. They figured out, you know, getting the data back via satellite is great. You can do that anywhere, but there's a limit to how much information you can get. So they developed a cell phone technology such that if you're in the range of a cell phone, these tags will access the, the cell phone tower and download the data, basically a remote computer um, down log, download. So why was this important? Well, these are some data on Galapagos sea lions. This was what, an Argo satellite track. This was sort of still the bread and butter of what we do. But for a whole variety of reasons, <clears throat> these tags are only uh, so good in terms of the locations. When you add the GPS tracking capability, this is what you find. The, the black is the, is the real track of the animal and the, the uh, white is the, is the Argos track of the animal. 
Now this is important because again, here's California sea lions with the same uh, tracking device. So we have the same tracking. These are Argos positions and these are GPS locations of uh, California sea lions. You can see that if all we had was these yellow dots, these are the Argos positions, we really wouldn't know what the animal was doing, but you put the GPS locations, which are much higher quality locations, you can see that this California sea lion was really working along the Monterey Canyon and then uh, going up here to, to the Santa Cruz and then going down to Monterey. And you would have never, with the, the traditional, the, the, more, the more available Argos locations, you would have never been able to get that resolution of movement patterns. And so again, uh, significantly increasing our ability to understand what these animals do. So, okay, here's all this technology. What does it tell us about what these animals do and how can we use it to figure out how they work and what they're doing? These are tracks of four different species, excuse me, four different species of seals. These are, the red is crab eater seals, uh, the blue right there is a Waddell seal. Uh, this is an Antarctic fur seal, and this is a southern elephant seal. And so you can see horizontally in the spatial domain, these animals are really using the Antarctic uh, in, a ver in very different ways. The green are elephant seals, they're moving broadly. Antarctic fur seal females are moving broadly, whereas the crab eater and Weddell seals are pretty much staying on the continental shelf in the, in the region of the Antarctic Peninsula. These animals also are, are partitioning the environment in terms of, of the diving range and the amount of time and uh, time at depth that they spend. This is, these are data on a leopard seal. Uh, these are crab eater seals doing about four minute dives on average to 61 meters. Waddell seals to about 12 minute dives to 91 meters. And then elephant seals diving routinely at almost 400 meters for about 24 minutes each. So we're starting to see how these animals partition the environment, where they go and what kinds of things they do. Now the latest <clears throat> in, in a lot of this technology is the ability to not only figure out what the animals are doing and where they are, but aspects of the environment they live in. And so this is a, a tag again made at the University of St. Andrews, the Sea Mammal Research Unit. This is a CTD tag. So that's conductivity, temperature and depth. This measures the salinity of the seawater and the temperature of the seawater as the animal is moving through the environment. So these tags tell us not only where the animal is, but aspects of the environment that it lives in. This is a track of an elephant seal female, and these are eddies, so like uh, hurricanes in the ocean. And these, we're starting to be able to understand how the animals move in the ocean with respect to the oceanography. How do they, how, we're defining the habitats of the environment and how the animal uh, survives in it. So the latest and greatest of these tags is we not only have the conductivity and temperature, but now we've added, added a fluorometer. So here's a track of an elephant seal that shows us the temperature profile. So this, you can see the warmer surface water the colder, deeper water is the track of the animal. Here's the salinity profile. So this is uh, saltier, more saline water. This is fresher surface water. And now with this fluorometer tag, we can measure the phytoplankton content of the water. So this is, this is sort of telling us where the food is, where the, the primary production is in the ocean. And <clears throat> I've got a graduate student, Teresa Keats, who is now looking at the fine scale movements of elephant seals relative to how the ocean works and defining the ocean habitats and how elephant seals are, are going to where the food is and why the food is there. This shows you another example of, <clears throat> here's that eddy that we were looking at just a minute ago. Here's the track of an elephant seal. And you can, these eddies are either upwelling or downwelling eddies. This is a downwelling eddy. And you can see the temperature profile as that animal swims through the eddy it's pushing, it's a downwelling eddy. And these animals are using that because there's a whole chain of um, trophic, trophic chain of community of organisms that, that elephant seal was feeding on. <clears throat> Back to the Antarctic and asking questions about the habitat and how these animals use the habitat in different ways. Here is the uh, ice, 
ice habitat of the elephant seal of, of the Antarctic. I'm saying elephant seals because these red dots are elephant seals, these green dots are crab eater seals. So these are crab eater seals in green, elephant seals in red. And take home message here is that here's the elephant seals going to Falkland and South Georgia Island. They can go in and out of the ice. They don't care, they can work both. But you notice that the green dots, the crab eater seals never leave the ice. And so this gets to uh, understanding their habitat requirements and how, as we get into global changing climate, how these animals are gonna uh, deal with it. So <clears throat> I mentioned that these animals collect data on the environment and we've been mostly interested in uh, understanding how the, how the seals uh, use the environment, but they also provide data in situations where it's very hard for us to go. It just showed you those pictures of seals moving through the ice. We don't have technology that allows us to cl collect temperature and depth profiles in the ice unless you're going with a ship or you, you walk out in the ice and put an uh, instrumentation down. And so we've now, a lot of colleagues, myself included, have been putting tags out on, on a variety of different species to collect oceanographic data. And so this was a story back in 2008. There is this area right here is the Wilkins Ice Shelf. And this is a satellite image in February of 2008, March and May. And you can see, there's a, you can't really tell that this is ice. You can start to see something's happening and this whole ice shelf breaks off into the ocean. So this was ice that was uh, coming off the land and then floating on the, on the ocean. And it was nice and stable here. It's starting to fall apart and it falls off. So from February to May, this event happened. We had put tags out on elephant seals earlier that year. And I, I said, oh my gosh, we've got tracks of elephant seals through this area. And so I, I sort of put out the word and I finally got uh, Lori Padman, a, a, an ice uh, oceanographer, physicist, contacted me and, I, and we gave him all the data we had. And what he did with those data is the first thing is, is he started uh, looking at the depth profiles and he said, hey, you know, these animals are diving deeper than the ocean. I mean, deeper than the, the bottom. And I, I said, yeah, I know they're not mole seals. The bathymetry is not very good. He says, yeah, I know. We can use these data to map the ocean floor. So what he did is he used the data to create a much higher quality of view of this region of the Antarctic, which there was only a few data points that were actually taken in terms of how deep the, how deep the ocean was there. What he found is that there were some canyons in this region. So here's this ice shelf. So there was canyons, and this is uh, ocean water at about 200 meters. And in the Antarctic, unlike up here, as you go, the surface water is the coldest, and as you go deeper, the water's a little warmer. And so this red shows this warm, what we call circumpolar deep water. There's a current that runs it's a current that runs along the coast this way. And so whenever you have a canyon, a certain amount of that water is gonna curve, peel off and go up that canyon. And what we found is here's that warm deep water coming up underneath this ice shelf. And you can see now that it's cooler, that it's cooled, colder water coming out from underneath the ice shelf, warmer water going in. So our elephant seals were able to help fill the, the, the heat budget. When people noticed this ice shelf fell, the amount of heat coming from the atmosphere wasn't sufficient to describe why it broke up. But when you put this, what they call now basal melt, water that's from this deep ocean water coming up, warming the underside of that ice shelf, it all made sense. And now this has become one of the, they call this basal melt. And it's one of the major factors, not just what happens in the atmosphere, but how the ocean is affecting the, uh, the crumbling of these ice shelves in Antarctica. Okay, so that gives us some ideas of what animals are doing in their habitat. But here's an example of using modern technology that's off the shelf, in this case, those heart rate recorders that we can go and work out on. Well, we adapted those to be able to measure the heart rate of a swimming elephant seal. And some work by Russ Andrews, who was a graduate student at the time working with us. And here's the diving pattern of an elephant seal you can see that for some reason, all of a sudden it went deeper here.
here's the heart rate of that elf, of that animal. So when it's at the surface breathing, reoxygenating, its heart rate is about 100 to 120 beats per minute. When it's at the bottom of the dive at depth swimming around, it's about 40 beats per minute. And then something happened here. We don't know what it was, but obviously the animal probably got spooked. It dove deeper and its heart rate dropped to probably about four to 10 beats per minute. And then it came back up and resumed sort of its normal activity. So we're now able to get some physiological measurements. And here's Paul Panganis, who is, uh, was a graduate student years, years ago. He uh, works at the Scripps Institution of Oceanography. Gita McDonald, who's a faculty member now at uh, Moss Landing Marine Lab, and Corey Champaign, faculty at the University of Washington. We've got an elephant seal nest ties, and we're putting a whole series of uh, electronic sensors that in this animal, when it's freely diving, we can measure the oxygen content of its blood. So you know those little uh, oximeters? Well, we've got an internal oximeter that we put a catheter in. And so here's the, the dive, here's the dive profile of the animal. So it's at the surface here and here. And here's the, uh, at the surface, the blood is being reoxygenated. So here's the partial pressure of oxygen. And then as the animal dives, that oxygen level declines to where it gets to almost no oxygen left in the blood. This is where we would black out. And so the final, basically they're getting every ounce of oxygen out of that blood um, over a dive. Now this work was actually, here's the track where we show in a three-dimensional plot, here's all the oxygen rich blood and then it, that blood sort of declines. And so you can able, the animal is released at Monterey and it swims back to Anya Nuevo. It's a picture of the animal there. This work was done by this gal, uh, Jessica Mir. And you may remember of the two women that were the spacewalk, uh, the first all-female spacewalk. This work that was done here with Paul Panganis at Scripps uh, was Jessica Mir's uh, dissertation research. She did half of work on emperor penguins, the other half on, on elephant seals with us here at Santa Cruz. So, I always say we may not be doing space uh, rocket science, but it may lead to rocket science. Now, following up on this sort of same technology, this is a, a complex slide from Terry Williams' lab. And Terry's very interested in heart rate and escape response. And she recently published a paper in Science where she was looking at narwhals. And she's got one of these heart rate recorders that she put on a narwhal. You can see the diving pattern, the narwhal here, and looking at how its heart rate, using um, the heart rate as a measure of metabolic rate to estimate that the animal was uh, working harder. And these animals basically uh, freak out. There's a lot of seismic survey work that's being done. And there's a, there's a difficulty because when you freak out and run away from something, the flight or flight response, your heart rate goes up. But remember, I just showed you all these examples of heart rate declining during the dive. And so Terry's been interested in about this push-pull of the adrenergic response that said, I need to increase my heart rate versus the cognitive response saying, no, I shouldn't. And so this, she's interested in this interaction between competing demands. Uh, this is a, an example of one of her students, Anthony Pagano, who's using these kinds of tracking technologies to look at the movements of polar bears where they're look, they have accelerometers and cameras on these animals that allow them to, to estimate where, look at where the animals are going and where they're spending their time and what they're doing. So again, just the examples of the tremendous, remember I started with, we knew so little, and now we're just overwhelmed in incredible information of these animals. This is a complex slide, but I'll, so basically just say this is heart rate of a blue whale. So this is Jeremy Goldbogen, Paul Panganis, and a number of other investigators, Jeremy's at Hopkins Marine Station, where they took this technology of heart rates and placed it on a blue whale. And so now we've got heart rate of a free swimming blue whale. And so here we see the diving pattern of that blue whale. Here it's at the surface. Here's the animal's heart rate. Again, you see that bradycardia, that reduction of heart rate, uh, that increasing at the surface. And basically they could say, here's the descent, the animal's heart rate declines. When it starts to lunge feed, its heart rate goes up because it's working. 
uh, when it's sort of processing the food, the heart rate drops, but then it surfaces, its heart rate goes up and it's at the surface, its heart rate uh, is, is quite high. So remember we said 100 beats, 120 beats per minute for an elephant seal. This animal, its normal resting heart rate is 30 beats per minute and normal underwater heart rate is less than 10 beats per minute. So just think about that, 10 beats per minute that's, what is it, every six seconds. So hold your breath and, and make 10 beats over the, and actually it's more like four beats per minute. So once every 15 seconds, your heart beats. Think about that. So <clears throat> the story continues. And uh, last time I talked a little bit about the work that Ber Jeremy Goldbogen has been doing on feeding and with a bunch of other colleagues, but the question now becomes, <clears throat> where are these animals going and what are they doing? And this, this now is work that Bruce Mate has done up at Oregon State University. And Bruce has been really one of the, just like Jerry Coyman was a pioneer in diving behavior, Bruce Mate has been a pioneer in trying to figure out where animals go. He spent years developing a satellite tracking tag that he could put on, on whales. And they finally came up with, uh, it's a combination of figuring out ways to get the tag on the animal and also getting tags that will, will hold. And so they, <clears throat> they built a tag that is coated with antibiotics and it may look nasty, but this thing anchors in the, in the uh, skin of the animal. And some of these tags have actually been put out for over a year. And that allows us to get movements. These are some data that Bruce Mate took uh, as part of our tagging Pacific predators. Each one of these is a track of a separate blue whale that had been tagged somewhere uh, in California, so do that again. Yeah, they're all tagged along the California coast, but you can see individuals coming down either Costa Rica Dome or up into Baja, and but most of them staying along the coastline. Bruce was also able to put these tags out on humpback whales in Hawaii, and you can see that the animals, we, we knew that the animals left Hawaii and came up to uh, southeastern Alaska and the Aleutians, but we never knew exactly the route that they took. And so he was able to track these animals. And then here they are working inside of the fjords of southeastern Alaska. So again, our ability to figure out where these animals are going. Now, you couldn't put one of those large tags on a small cetacean. And so this is where Russ Andrews, the guy that developed the first heart rate recorders, came up with what he called a low impact percutaneous external electronics transmitter. Had little barbules, and you can ideally shoot that into the dorsal fin. And this has created just an amazing amount of data. Here's, they, in the picture here, that's a, a killer whale. Here's a picture of a killer whale. And they put these tags out on killer whales. And here that the tags are out in the Antarctic. And what they found is, and the people have made observations that you'd see killer whales like this picture I took, where the white is very clean. Later on, they'd see animals with a very dirty looking uh, patch. And it was algae collecting on that patch while the animal was, was swimming around in the Antarctic. What they found is that animals would leave Antarctica, go to the warmer water. So this is sea surface temperature. And they would leave, go up here, warm up, and then come back. So you see many of these tracks, they go up, warm up, come back, go up, the track stopped. And what they realized that this was the animal's thermoregulating. When you're in the Antarctic, remember, the skin is living tissue. And if you're in the cold water, it's hard to keep blood. You can put a certain amount of blood flow out there, but just enough to keep the tissue alive. You're not going to be able to put enough uh, blood out there to actually regenerate and have the tissue grow. So what killer whales are doing is that they'll feed for a few weeks. They'll get dirty. Their, their skin is not sloughing off. They'll come up, warm up in the tropics, do a little sunbathing, and then come back and feed again. And so uh, one of these really interesting stories that we had no idea until we actually put a tracking device out. These devices have also been used by Greg Shore and company on beaked whales. And again, uh, we had those tags that I showed you, the digital tags, those were attached by suction cups. So we'd get tremendous amount of data but over a few hours, the longest those tags last would be 24 hours. So Greg used these uh, limpet tags 
And these now are positions of different individual beaked whales in Southern California bite. And you can see the movement patterns of the animals uh, in and out in this area. And this is work that's been funded by the US Navy because this is an area where the Navy does a lot of testing of its, uh, a lot of exercise for naval operations. So the concern was, are the naval operations uh, affecting beaked whales in an adverse way? San Nicolas, San Clemente Island, Catalina Island, Santa Barbara Island. So here's the record of uh, these beaked whales. And now we've got a new record, some 18, look at this animal working routinely 1800 meters. We can see the, the distribution of the dives, uh, differences, the, the, there's sort of these deep dives that are long and deep and these shallow dives. The thing I haven't talked about is look at how much time these animals spend at the surface. Almost very, very little time at the surface. They make these extremely long dives. And what we think that these dives that are in many, many examples, instances, uh, well over an hour. So it's 80 minutes there, 40. So these dives are all almost over an hour or longer. I don't have time to go into the physiology, but one of the things that happens when you dive very, very long, you start to use other chemical processes that don't use oxygen. But if you do that, you have to pay that oxygen debt back up and that takes time. And so what we think is happening here is that it makes these long foraging dives and then it's making a bunch of shallower, shorter dives where it's processing the lactic acid that was developed over that really long time. Why don't they sit at the surface? We think that has to do with avoiding predators. Here's some work done by Natasha Aguilar uh, she works out of the, I think, the Canary Islands. And they put two tags out on beaked whales. So these are three different locations, but there's actually two diving records here. So the, this is one individual in light blue, teal, and here's the other individual. These animals are diving with extreme uh, symmetry in terms of, of cohesion of their diving pattern. This is a record showing how far apart these two individuals are. And again, because they're vocalizing and each have these receivers, they can record the time, uh, the time delay before the, the, uh, their sounds are from one individual is recovered by the other. And this is the distance. These animals are very, very close together. Two individuals here, very, very close to, this is 250, 500 meters. These individuals are very close together. Why do they do this? We think it's to avoid this guy, killer whale predation. Kill it, this is the range of, of foraging depth, feeding depth of a killer whale. And so the animal, the killer whales are going maybe about 760 meters. Here's where these beaked whales are feeding. And so what the idea is, is that I, what I haven't also, what I, what I haven't told you about this figure is these red triangles are where the animals start vocalizing and stop vocalizing. Start vocalizing, stop vocalizing. So they're very quiet in the surface area. Start vocalizing, stop vocalizing. So they're very quiet here and they make all of their sounds at depth. The sounds at depth are done well below, typically below the, the range of a killer whale's feeding. The other thing is that when these guys surface, they surface erratically relative to where they started the dive. So if a killer whale did hear them, it would think, okay, I'm gonna predict that the animal uh, is going along, it started its dive here, I hear it, it's gonna surface over here. They randomize, somehow randomize where they surface. So this is this just showing you that relative to where the animal uh, started its dive, they come up in a very clustered way so that would make it hard for a predator to figure out where they, where they surfaced. So this is that classic arms race of predator and prey, the prey outsmarting the predator and the predator trying to catch up. I'm gonna finish with uh, going back to some of the work that Jeremy Goldbogen has been doing. These are a variety of different tags that have cameras on them. And he's done a lot of work here in Monterey Bay on blue whales and humpback whales. Uh, again, here's the, putting those tags on with suction cups. Here's the bottom of the dives and you can see these feeding events. And again, here's the camera images of uh, where these animals are swimming. You can see their mouth opening. 
They've also then looked not only at where the animal is diving and when it's feeding, they can look at following behind the animal as it's foraging. They use an echo sounder, a fish finder, that tells us here's the layer of krill that these animals are feeding on. And you can see the lunges of, of the blue whale as it's feeding through this, uh, through this layer of, of schooling krill. They've also put these tags out on sperm whales, and here's all of the different uh, um, squid beaks that they found in these sperm whales. Uh, here's the diving pattern of a, of a sperm whale. And again, using the, the prey capture, they can, they can see using the recovery of the echoes, here's, here's prey capture events of these sperm whales at depth as they're feeding on, their, on, their, uh, on squid. Okay, so again, we've been able to work with our colleagues and start to ask the question, how do these different marine mammals partition the marine environment? And this is a figure showing elephant seals in red, uh, blue whales in this, I don't know, color, <laughs> um, California sea lions in blue, and humpback whales in light blue. So you can, you can see how these animals are partitioning their use of the California uh, current, the, the, the west coast of the US, the eastern Pacific. We can get a close up of the blue whale movement patterns. These are all data from, from Bruce Mate. You can see they're feeding off the coast here, going down, calving in Baja California and calving off the Costa Rica Dome. Uh, here's humpback whales doing something very similar, feeding off the coast here, taking advantage of the high productivity and then going and breeding off the Costa Rica Dome. We can use these tracking data to see how well our current marine sanctuaries are doing, how we can use them to define marine protected areas. To give you an idea of the value of this, you can see here that elephant seals, the sanctuary is very good at protecting the breeding colonies of elephant seals, but not very good in terms of protecting their foraging habitat, which is Considering where these animals are feeding, that'd be kind of hard. You can't protect the entire Pacific. For blue whales, these sanctuaries are doing a pretty good job of protecting some of the prime feeding habitat of the, calf of the blue whales. Uh, and here's this, the Channel Islands uh, National Monument and the Monterey Bay National Marine Sanctuary. Here's a humpback whale, again, uh, not as much data, but showing tremendous coverage, especially the Monterey Bay Sanctuary, really is, is over the habitat that these animals are doing most of their feeding. So really good coverage there. California sea lions, uh, the Channel Islands National Monument does a reasonable job, but these guys are feeding heavily in the Southern California Bight with a few individuals coming up to the north. And I'm now gonna close with, to me, what is exciting about how the field has evolved. Remember, I started with just a kitchen timer that Jerry Coyman did by himself in the Antarctic. Throughout this talk, you've heard me bring in more and more people doing various things. And what's really exciting is how the field has become incredibly collaborative. This is a paper that was published last year in Science in Nature. And all of these people are individuals who contributed to this a paper where we took all of the tracking data, birds, seabirds and marine mammals, some 17 species, 4,000 tracks, to put together this image that integrated all of the tracking data collected for seabirds and marine mammals in the Southern Ocean. And we did this because we wanted to figure out where are the best places to put protected areas. Can we use these data to, for conservation of these animals? And so what we found is that the areas that are most important for these marine mammals and seabirds in the Southern Ocean is this region of, around South Georgia, these sort of coastal areas, the Antarctic mainland, and up here, this area called the Kerguelen Plateau. We looked, here's the tracks, here's these regions, and then we asked, how much of these habitats are protected? And in the Southern Ocean for the, the SCAR and the CAMLAR, Committee on, on Conservation of Antarctic Marine Living Resources, they have already been producing marine protected areas. And so these are 
areas that are either proposed, this, these are current uh, marine protected areas. These are, this one is now in place, the Ross Sea Marine Protected Area. This one is one that is uh, proposed. Surprisingly, 27% of this critical habitat is currently protected by marine protected areas. And when you put the proposed and the current ones, up to 40% of this habitat, critical habitat of the Southern Ocean for birds and mammals is, is, is or will be protected. Now, the final part of this story is to ask what will happen in the future? Are these protected areas sufficient? And what we found is that for overall, as the climate changes, these habitats will uh, decrease. But for, for the subantarctic regions, which is here and here, the, the protected area will actually increase. But these areas around the main Antarctic, uh, the area that's protected will actually decrease. So that's uh, what I wanted to share, share with you today. Uh, it, uh, a lot of information, but it represents the work of a lot of individuals relying on a significant uh, development in technology and the creative, uh, creative talents of individuals to figure out how to deploy these tags. So if we have time, I'll, I'll take any questions. All right, thank you very much, Dan. Um, we've got a couple of questions. You actually responded to quite a number of the questions, but um, a couple of questions about the monitoring devices. Just how um, how other uh, they, how many how many seals are monitored at once, and do the devices cause any problems for them, stress or injury? Yeah, uh, I can't answer the question. I mean. There are so many different studies. We, we here at Santa Cruz. I'll talk about this next time. We we put out about ten or twenty tags on elephant seals uh, every cycle. So they have they go to sea twice twice a year. So we try and put out ten to twenty tags uh, every cycle on northern elephant seals. There's a bunch of investigators working all over the the planet uh, putting tags not only on marine mammals. There's people studying sharks and tunas and seabirds and Quite honestly, it's such a such a large community now. There's an international biologging society where where every two or three years we get together and everybody shares notes. And so it's a, I mean, we have our own society. They're thinking about creating it. We have an animal biotelemetry journal. So it's a it's a big community and it's exciting to be part of that community. How important, how do these tags cause problems? Wonderful question we're interested in the normal behavior of these animals. And so we do have to be concerned whether these tags are creating aberrant behavior. Do they, do they harm the animal in any way? So a lot of us have put efforts, we've put tags, we've studied the survival, the mass change, the uh, uh, reproductive output of female elephant seals. We've tracked over 800 female elephant seals and what we found, if you look at the time of time at sea, how long the animal goes to sea, the trip duration, the mass gain, all the parameters we can measure without a tag and compare that to animals with tags, we found that animals with tags actually have a slightly better uh, survival rate and, and mass gain than females without tags. The caveat is we don't put our tags out randomly. We, we're not going to put a tag on a female that doesn't look very good. So I would never even though it sounded like I was saying that it does the animals do better, what it really means is that we haven't been able to see a difference and that, uh, that there, if there's any, any effect, it's very, very small, if, if at all. And we have people who have been looking at the hydrodynamics, doing uh, experiments in flow chambers, doing uh, 3D uh, modeling to look at how to reduce the amount of drag from the tag. For our elephant seals, for all the pinnipeds, we glue the tags on with, with five minute epoxy. And so it's, it's, it'll fall off every time whenever, whenever they molt. The people that use the D tags, those are suction cup tags, those will fall off within a day. The tags with the little barbs uh, fall off in about two or three months. And there is, you know, for the most part, people have followed those animals and, and found uh, minimal, minimal effects, but it, it, it's always a concern. And, and, Everybody is, is 
one of the things we do when we do these studies is to follow the animals as best we can, uh, not only listen to them electronically, but go and see the animal for, and take pictures of these cetaceans to, to ensure that uh, we're having uh, no impact on them.